This is the Last Minute Blues Podcast with Donnie Fandango, Jeff Burton, Alex Ferrario, and former Blues defenseman Jamie Rivers. It is the Last Minute Blues Podcast. Donnie Fandango in studio. Uh, joined by Jeremy Rutherford of The Athletic as well as Alex Ferrario from 101 ESPN. Gentlemen, it's wonderful to see your faces. How you doing? I'm surprised we're seeing JR because I think this guy has been... Uh, his face has been in a laptop and cell phone probably for the last 48 hours. Well, I'll tell you this. Been on Snuggy Watch <laughs> right? 2024. I we, gosh, we should have came up with that name last week. Snuggy Watch. We could have ran with I it. Gave, I gave JR the title of his first article if Snuggerud would have gone pro, and I said, even a Snuggy can't keep the blues warm. <laughs> he did say that. I'm like, this is a great line for you. Yeah. I couldn't go with it. I didn't. Yeah, good, <laughs> I good, good. You. It was terrible. Because if it would have been a good reaction, I would have taken credit. <laughs> if not, they wouldn't have believed that it was Alex. The one guy's over here going, it was told me. me. <laughs> no, I got to tell you, and I've probably mentioned before that I like to get out of the house when I write, take the laptop somewhere, and I bounce everywhere. I mean, I go to McAllister's, I go to Pomodoro's, I go to Bread Company. But yesterday, I happened to pick uh, McDonald's. They got real good, strong Wi-Fi. You sit in the corner. I love to people watch. And so anyway, I'm working on, to do it. <laughs> working on some things, and then all all of a sudden, uh, the Snuggerud stuff happens, which turns into now you interview him, you transcribe the interview, you write the story. I was at McDonald's in Arnold yesterday from about 9 a.m. till about 5 p.m. Oh and what's funny is when I've done that before, sometimes these 16 or 17-year-old kids will come in for their shift and they'll work three hours and they'll walk past me and they go, man, I've been here three hours. <laughs> Buddy, I, I don't even work here and I've been here for nine hours. Jerry's like, I've been here for three of your shifts already. <laughs> so you're legitimately there for 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 nine out anybody come up to you and be like uh sir can uh, i buy you a big mac <laughs> right do you don't have a home like you need one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't say a word they just come wipe the tables around you and keep on going i think it's pretty oblivious so so, so how did that so how did that go down yesterday and how were you able to to get a chance to speak with uh, mr snuggerud because i did read the article hey! thank you very much hey, look at that i was going to send that. it to look him that. this morning just as a troll but i'm like no don't be too well my whole thing was going to be i was going to come Come in and be like, boy, it would be so great if somebody just had the chance to talk to him. Man, I wish but Pierre I, LeBrun could have got a piece with Jimmy Snuggerud. But there's no way I could have done that with a straight face. Well, I am just not that good of a poker Alex, player. Alex, here's the thing. I knew that he was going to claim to have read the article, so I bought a little quiz here. Did you? Let's go. Right, let's yeah. go. Let's yeah. take it. I'm That's in. I'm in. And I need you to fill this out, Donnie, if we're going to finish this podcast. Right, today. I got two or three question quiz here for you, Donnie. Question number one. Jimmy Snuggerud is not going to join the Blues. He's going to return to which University. He is a Golden Gopher. Oh. University of Minnesota Golden Gopher. One for one. Dude, that I know point, this. I, that point, I read it. At that I point swear. in high school, I felt like I was going to ace my exam, but then the next, like, 35 questions I all got <laughs> wrong. It's like, what the hell? He, he wants to return to the University of Minnesota because he wants to win a national championship. Whoa, Look smokes. at you. He did Look at article. you. See, this is, this, is, this is coming out to be okay. For a couple okay. of reasons here. Let me tell you why. First of all, I think it's super badass that the kid is a competitor and wants to go back and wants to friggin' finish what he friggin' started. I think that is... I love that. Also, the, the team is not in a spot right now where it's crucial for us to have Jimmy Snuggerud around. Plenty of time for the kid to go back and to learn and meet more college girls and to do his thing before he goes pro. So, man, I think that this is freaking awesome. Yeah, and, and Donnie, you were asking. Uh, and yeah, Alex how, how is, it came about. Well, and Alex I, is I, sitting uh, next to me here, and, uh, you know, this happened, what, twice in the last five or six years, just the timing of when something is announced. So, Alex, we're on the radio yesterday, and they're saying, so what's going on? What's happening with Snuggerud? And listen, you can make phone calls, and you can try to be in the inner circle, uh, it's tough, right? These people keep these things pretty tight, and that's what's been happening with uh, Snuggerud. And so yesterday, what is it, 105, yeah. 115 in mm -hmm. the afternoon, uh, I'm on the show with Alex, and I say, look, I think he's going to sign. I think he's, it's headed that direction. I think there's a possibility that he could play Thursday against the San Jose Sharks. Okay, Jeremy, thanks uh, for your time. We'll talk to you later. We'll talk to you next week, and uh, we'll continue to be on, on Snuggy Watch. One minute later. <laughs> no joke, when we were wrapping up with JR, I held my hand. You go look back on our YouTube video of this. I held my hand up to BK because I was looking at Twitter and I was going to say because it was a NIL that covered the Minnesota tweet that said Jimmy Snuggerud is returning. 
and you know how Twitter is these days, Donnie. You know, nobody's got the check marks. You have no idea if they're real or if they're fake. And right. so I'm like, okay, a couple days after April Fool's, I'm not falling for this trash. So I held my hand up, and then I read it, and I'm like, nah, it's not Minnesota. It's not the Blues. I'm not going to say anything. So we let JR go, and then about 30 seconds after JR had hung up, BK and I were talking, and then the University of Minnesota had popped up, and it said Snuggaroo's returning. So, I mean, it, it happened that fast, but, I mean... I, I think there were there were people in the personnel with the Blues that thought Jimmy Snuggerud was going to be yep. signing. So I mean, I, it really was to Jr's article. Um, it came down to Snuggerud sitting up in his bedroom saying, "I think I want to go back to college." Like that's what the decision had come down to. I mean, what he told you, Jr, that yesterday or on the bus ride back from Sioux Falls, he was in full belief that he was going to re-sign with the Blues and join them. And then overnight it was, not nope, you know what, I think I want to return to college. And I'm with you, Donnie. I, my first reaction yesterday was shock because I think I was just – I built it up in my head to where it was like, Snuggerud's coming here. Like, Mm -hmm. you just won a gold. Sure, you got bounced, but previously you were in the Frozen Four with your team. What else do you need to do? Now you've got pro in front of you. But then the more I thought about it, I mean, the University of Minnesota, their captain just signed with the Boston Bruins. So there's a captain captaincy available for the University of Minnesota for a guy that has been very passionate about playing for him with his dad and with his grandpa playing there. So that, on top of him wanting to play for the national championship and reading JR's piece today, also him saying, like, I want to be perfect by the time I get to the NHL level. Yeah. I would much rather have that from the kid than saying, I just want to go pro and get my money. So I think this is the best case scenario for the Blues. You're in a playoff race. But does it really make sense? Because you could do a, you could go seven and zero down the stretch, and miss by a point, and then you got six games of Jimmy Snuggerud with nothing to show for it. And I understand, and I you know, and I have heard the argument, uh, you know, hey, if the guy's going to be here, you want to sign him, you want to get him into the fold, the whole thing. I understand that, but it still did not make a ton of sense to me to burn an entire year of service for seven friggin' games and maybe the playoffs, maybe like. Guys, I I understand, but of all of the business parts that we've been learning about sports in the last ten to fifteen and twenty years, and you, I just it just didn't make logical sense to me to have that guy here for seven games and to burn a whole friggin' year. So I'm kind of relieved that that didn't happen as well. Yeah. So when when this all went down at at one fifteen, I was in a tough spot because. I had already had the bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit That's true. in the morning. He was like, do I want to and go Big Mac? And now it's one thirty, and I'm yeah. sitting here going, Big Mac. You're like, <laughs> Sarah's calling him saying, are you coming home for dinner? And Jared's like, ah, Big Mac, go fish nuggets. sandwich. Yeah. So I, I go could double get fish. a kid's meal and lie and say my kid's here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you see the kids? They're over there. He's over there. <laughs> yeah. And the other one's over there. <laughs> but I, uh, so as soon as the tweet comes out from Minnesota, uh, I text uh, Jimmy Snuggerud, and here's my text. I said, you know, Jimmy, I, I purposely haven't, you know, bugged you during the process here. Um, congratulations on your decision. Um, now that it's made, could we chat for a few minutes? And 10 seconds later, uh, hey, give me a call. So called him and spent about 15, 20 minutes on the phone, and we touched on everything that you guys have just talked about, and so I can address some of these questions. Um, number one is what Alex said. You know, he he wants to win a national championship, uh, and what people may or may not know is that his grandpa went to the University of Minnesota. His dad went to the University of Minnesota, Dave Snugrud. Uh, his dad lost a national championship game in overtime Oof. with the Golden Gophers yep. in 1989. Last year, uh, Jimmy Snugrud lost a national championship in overtime to Quinnipiac. So he, he said that I, I want to win a national championship. And guess where the national championship game is at? St. Louis. St. Louis. Hey, now. And secondly, he said, and people who have watched Jimmy a lot the last couple weeks, months, um, you know, I haven't watched him all that much have said that, you know, he just hasn't played well. And so you're on the phone with him. You know, you do ask tough questions, but I don't want to say, hey, you haven't played well. He brought it up. Yeah. He said, look, I played like junk the last couple months. I let my teammates down, and I want to get back and work on. And he, without me asking, names X, Y, Z, puck control, puck possession, everything. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to get better at. So I understand where Blues fans are maybe disappointed that he's not here. He's not on the ice tomorrow night in Nashville. But if you get a better player as a result of him spending the year there, plus you have a guy who just sounds like a winner, 
you know, I think this is I think this is good news for the Blues. Yeah. I'm, I'm sitting at my kitchen table <clears throat> reading the article, believe it or not, and I'm thinking to myself as I'm reading this, as or as I'm reading the article, I'm liking the kid more <laughs> and more than I already did yep. going into it. When he, as you said, is singling out the things that he knows that he needs to work on and the commitment to winning, I, I mean... I love this guy. Got a lineup with him and Jake Neighbors. Let's freaking go. And Alexi Torchenko. Yeah, yeah. I thought yeah. he had a great quote with Lou the other day talking about how, like, I don't care that I'm playing in the top six. I care about winning hockey games yeah. and defending my team. And it's like, at least you've got these these younger pieces that understand what it's going to take, and I think that's good for the Blues. The other thing with, with Jimmy Snuggeroo, too, that I was thinking is, because a lot of people are talking about, you know, oh, well, he's just going to drag this thing out for the Blues and take it all the way up so that he can sign wherever he wants. Or people were referencing Brock Faber because that's who we spoke to with Minnesota. And they're they're coming up with this odd conspiracy theory that Brock Faber forced his way to be traded to the Minnesota Wild. And none of that is true in the sense of Jimmy Snuggerud is pursuing that national championship, but on the other side of this one, he told you, like, the the goal now is to sign after my junior season. It's just this one more year. The the comp for this to me, and I was doing a ton of looking through Hockey DB last night of finding out, like, okay, who's gone through this before in terms of NHL players or Blues players that have forego the opportunity to go to the NHL for one more year of college? TJ Oshie is it. I mean, you were talking about a first-round pick that said, rather than go to the NHL, I'm going to go back for one more year at the University of North Dakota because I want to pursue a national championship. And look at where TJ Oshie's career is right now. I'm not saying Stungard's going to have that same career, but sometimes I think it's good to have players that would like to be mature before they come to the NHL rather than just come to the NHL and figure it out as you go. Man, it's just, and it also, too, it's so self-aware. Like like the, Such an the adult move. like the, 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 the candidness of it I think is really fantastically remarkable. And and again, what I really enjoy here, and it, it kind of just goes off what I was just saying, is like the type of player that the blues seem to be going after and signing, whether that be young, whether that be some of the free agent stuff, is these guys that want to give it for the team. You know, your Sunquists, your Kessels, your, you know, and none of these are particularly sexy. I understand. So you've got to have <clears throat> your Jake Neighbors and Snuggerds and some of these guys turn around that can score and do the thing. But just that cohesion, that sort of like, here is what we're building towards is very, very exciting to me. Yeah, it definitely looks like a lot of character that they're building. And I know they put some time into that, you know, obviously when they go watch these kids and talk to them and, and uh, monitor them throughout their college years or their junior years. So... Uh, you know, whoever has got the pulse of the, the guys that they're drafting, um, you know, with Tony, the, the amateur draft mm-hmm. uh, scouting director, uh, these guys are doing a great job finding some good character. Guys, can I ask a question? So, like, so for the next year that, uh, you know, not not that the Blues, obviously we're paying very close attention to Jimmy Snuggerud this year, and, and we'll continue to be doing so, but, like, how does that relationship work when the player is in college, but he is, a, you know, a... a Member, not a member of the organization yet, but you know, a, a draft pick. Yeah. You know, is Doug Armstrong calling the 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 Minnesota coach and asking him questions, or is there a Blues guy showing up from time to time to say hello, or, or are they just completely separated until after the hockey season is over? How well, does that they, work? There, there's there's some contact. Uh, the Blues, first of all, you have to keep in mind this that with junior, it's different. Like you have their rights. Some of them are even signed to entry level deals, like a Dvorsky. In college, it's a little bit different because they're. They're still amateurs. They're not pros until they turn pros. Like a Dvorsky can come to training camp next year, even if he gets sent back to junior, whereas a Snugrood can't because he has not signed and turned pro. Okay. He can come to the development camps in yep. the off season. So in terms of like how much contact the NHL team could actually have with them, you know, I'm not sure in, ter- in terms of you know what's allowed. Uh, but Tim Taylor, who is with the Blues, he's the director of player personnel, and he's been their de- development guy for a long time. He's in touch with all these guys, and he has a staff too. Uh, just keep up with them. How are you doing? You know, progress charts, stuff like that. Yeah, well, and I got to imagine you keep that relationship going because you know you want to keep the relationship with the players so that when the time comes to sign, it's not like oh well, this team hasn't stayed in contact with sure, me. They don't sure. care about me, so now I don't want to sign a contract with you. I would imagine you want to keep that relationship pretty strong so you don't have that. 
what uh, the Philadelphia Flyers player had go through him where it was like, oh, I haven't had contact, I stopped talking to him, and then you don't sign with the team. Yeah, Cutter Gautier. Yeah, with, that's who it was, yeah. With that situation. And, and I'm glad you brought that up, Alex, because uh, I know a lot of Blues fans were also uh, kind of worried now that Snuggeroo did not sign. Um, the rule is that uh, in 2026, the Blues would then lose his rights uh, he would become a UFA, and he could sign with whomever, and that has happened before. College guys get to their senior year, and then they can come out and, and sign with whoever. I asked uh, Jimmy that. I said, hey, what do you say to the Blues fans who are worried about you potentially becoming UFA? And he said, well, nobody knows what the future is, but he said, I want to tell you this, but I don't know exactly how to say it, how it's going to come out, but I'll be at Minnesota one more year, and then I'll see you. Yeah. So I, I think he wants to play that last year. And then sign with the now Blues. the the, the I'll, I'll play the the devil's advocate side here, Donnie. So don't get angry with me here. Oh, God damn, I know you're I'm taking sorry. away my fun. But the hard part with that is like if you per, if you have that much passion for a national championship and you don't get there, I'd be worried that well, well maybe one more year. The senior year will be the year for me to get to the national championship, which is why he told you I, I'm going to say this, and I don't really know what the future holds, which I completely understand. He doesn't seem like a disgruntled player that doesn't want to be with the Blues. He seems like a player that wants to be with the Blues but has passion towards, yeah. I got other things on my to-do list to check off before. And look, again, going back to the maturity side of it, I would much rather have a player who sorts out things that would bug him if he moves on than move on and let those things eat at him for the rest of his career, thinking like, oh, I should have stayed at one more year of college, get disgruntled because the Blues wanted me to sign, and and now I don't want to be a part of the Blues. Like, I think this is the smart way to play it. I don't remember uh, the, the writer that you tweeted out the, the the interview that they had with Jimmy Snuggeroo. Yeah, it was, it was a Joe Smith or yeah, somebody. Yeah, Joe Smith, yeah, the uh, Athletic does and, a podcast. And so even in watching that, and if you go back, you look at Alex's feed and, and look at the video, when asked if he was ready to go pro, Jimmy Snuggerud did not look like he at all had to sign. Like, he looked like, I don't know, man. Yeah. Like So it, it seems very genuine that this kid was kicking this around. And yeah. I would much rather have him wait another year, get more seasoned, and come to us well, when and he's the thing ready. Too, sorry, Jared. The thing, too, with this is, like, looking at the roster that the Blues have – as much as we've talked about, do you burn a year, do you not burn a year, you want him for the Stanley Cup run, I think I would much rather this team have an offseason to sort out the issues that took place this season to where the consistency of them being bad from last year to this year and the inconsistency this season. I would much rather have that team sort out that mess before they start a season then I would have Jimmy Snuggerud on that team that's still trying to sort it all out, then go into an offseason and be like, okay, well, we got Jimmy, we burned a year, we got to sort this stuff out. Like, I think I would much rather have a little bit more patience in terms of what we're trying to accomplish than say, we got to do this fast because now we've got Snuggerud on the clock. Yeah, I think you're right. The, the one little hiccup that I think this could cause is that... Uh-oh, Donnie, don't listen. <laughs> no, he likes this kind of stuff. Right? I, I think that if you're Doug Armstrong, and let's say you're counting on Jimmy Snuggerud uh, playing one of those right-wing spots, maybe third line, right Right wing next year. Uh, well, now you got to go out and probably sign a guy. Like if Kapanen's not coming back and you want to bring in a couple top nine guys next year, uh, Snuggerud was going to be one of them. Well, now that he's not, you might have to either look for trade or go through free agency. And guess what? You know, in free agency, you're not typically going to find a cheap guy for number a one, one. Year deal. And two, you're not going to find a one year deal. So it's not like you can go out. I, mean, I guess you could, but uh, find that perfect fit where this guy is cheap, and he's not going to be as cheap as Snuggerud was at uh, 925000 and he's probably not going to sign for a year. So now you have to go out and maybe sign a guy multi-year, and then Snuggerud shows up the next year. So it's a little bit, but I would think that would be a bigger problem if the Blues were just needing, like, one guy. I mean, yeah. they need multiple guys. So even though you have Snuggerud, I think that it's not a big deal that you're still going to yeah. have to go out and find somebody else. So, guys, does this affect Pavel Buchnevich at all and his availability in the offseason? I... Because if I'm not mistaken, because he plays yeah. on the right side, so then if you moved him, then what do you got on the right well, he, side? Well, he plays left side. It would be Cairo and Neighbors on the right side right okay, now. Right. But I, I do think it's a good question because – it felt like you were probably going to move on from one of him or Jordan Kyrou in the offseason. That's what the whole conversation was this entire year of, like, what do you do with your top six and do you sign them? I, 
it'd be really tough to move on from that player now and not know that we have another top six winger to put into that position. And now, I mean, these last few games, Booch has been playing the center position. I really wonder if they're starting to look at this as maybe Booch should be a center for us moving forward. His goals haven't been there, but faceoffs haven't been awful. He's been a point per game player in the nine games he's played at the center position. Do you look at this and say, well, maybe we got something here? And now do we look at this as now we've got a centerman? Depending on what the contract situation looks like, do we go one more year and see what that looks like? Yeah, and Donnie Booch has played right, left, so he can play either. Okay, he goes everywhere. Obviously, he's played center too. But I mean, let's hypothetically say that they re-sign Booch Nevitz. You could still have him on your top line, left wing, and then your right side with neighbors Kairou, Snuggerud. You know, the next couple of years, and then you know, over time, obviously Snuggerud's going to climb his way up. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it still works. And even with those four, they still need. More. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, you're still talking about a center, you're still talking about a left winger, and then we're talking on the defensive side. So yeah, it, it seems like you got that in place, and it was like, oh, this is starting to match up really well with Snugger coming over, and you've got this looking good, and everybody's excited about Dvorsky, who I'm just not sure he's going to be here next year. I think you're probably going to go one more year. But yeah, it does feel like there's a lot more holes that need to be filled. And, and look, we, we could talk personnel all we want, like individual players. Right now, it's more of a team thing than anything that I think Doug Armstrong has to sift through because of what we saw with the Sharks and then what we saw with the um, the most recent game with, with who Edmonton. they just be Edmonton, thank you. Like That's the stuff that you have to sift through right now, and I don't think one player or two players is going to fix that. I'm glad you're not. I'm not the only one that does that because I, I can't count the number of times where the games just run together. Sometimes, oh I'll, yeah, we'll be oh, doing this. with you guys. I don't know how the hell you keep it straight. Post games, sometimes I say the wrong team. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're doing a radio hit, and uh, they'll say, uh, "What about that game last night?" And I literally have to think for oh, ten yeah. seconds. Who the <laughs> yeah. hell did they? What play just last happened night? last night? <laughs> uh, speaking of, uh, if we could rewind just a bit, uh, Saturday night. W- w- made me so angry like i don't i just this team is you know it's just more of what we've talked about a zillion times over the course of this year but you see saturday night happen and then you think oh boy here come the the oilers we are going to get friggin hosed and they you know i, I mean you know uh, bennington saves them again but i mean it's a game that by and large they had some really good spurts and i just don't understand this, this this is my theory with it and i could be completely off but so so you did not lose a game in regulation edmonton this year you beat them twice and then you lost once in overtime i think it was out in edmonton like you've had their number don't know why but you've had their number sometimes that just happens but edmonton especially in that game monday they played they tried to play pond hockey. They just tried to play, hey, we'll cherry pick on the blue line and get me the puck and then I'll go in and score goals. And at times they had sustained zone time. But every time the Blues have played against teams that like to play that way, the Blues have success. I mean, you go back through like Vancouver tries to do that at times. The Blues beat them twice. You talk about their matchup with the uh, other Pacific Division team, uh, Vegas, where they did that twice against them. Like they have success against those teams. Eastern Conference, how much success they had against the East this season. But when they play the four checking team that is hard nosed, Winnipeg, Nashville, like they're going to play this Thursday. Those are the teams that give the Blues fits, and I think it's because the Blues have the ability to forecheck. It's just if they don't, if they don't have to do it to win the game, they won't. They'll do the East-West style, and against Edmonton, it was like, okay, well, we get away with this because you guys aren't going to push us into our zone, so we'll push you into your zone, and you can't pull that outlet stuff on us because we're just as fast. But then when they try and do that against the San Jose Sharks team that literally only can play forecheck hockey right now, it's, oh, crap. So I, I just I, I feel like there's this this rift between the Blues' ability to say, "Hey, we're a four-checking team that is just going to go north-south on you. Good luck beating us," and then the oh wait, we could get away with this East-West style. Let's just stick with that in this game because that San Jose Sharks game, you were the better team in the first period. Mackenzie Blackwood stopped you because you had nobody in front of the net, and then it was oh great, we can't score, so might as well start doing our individual stuff. And and that is so well said. I think you're dead on with everything. You just said, and I think that kind of points to the issue that this team has that Craig Bruby underlined when he left is that this team in the first period tries to feel out 
what type of game it's going to be. And and the good Blues teams over the years, particularly that 2019 team in the second half, and I realized that was magic in a bottle, but they dropped the puck, they played the game, and they knew how they were going to play. Yep. Yeah. And this team, watch them. Watch them in the first period for the next however many games. And I realize there's probably going to be some urgency that maybe makes them play a little better early on. <laughs> I don't but, know. That San Jose game yeah. didn't have it. <laughs> but, but, but all I'm saying is uh, it's a feeling out process. Okay, is this going to be a four-checking game? Is this going to be a rush game? Are we east-west? Are they playing pawn? How are we going to respond yeah. it, it you can't play like that it feels like they're playing chess finding out what their move is before we make our move to where it's like when they had success it was here's what our move is good luck beating us it, 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 in my mind as you're saying that it seems to me to be saying i'm we're going to determine how hard we're going to work tonight yeah. in the first yeah. period kind of we're going to we are going to set the stage with how deep we're going to get into this thing tonight and i think that that is a freaking microcosm of the bs that we've been freaking watching this yeah, year that's from the time whole to thing time that leads Donnie, to the uh, uh, you know why do we start bad you yeah. know like that, why which are there we've bad been starts? asking that yeah, question yeah. for the last 2 years about the blues is like how did the starts come up? i mean we have we have the the head coach on our pregame every single game interviews with curbs it was from craig berube to drew banister every single game and almost i would say 75 percent of the games one of the coaches referenced we need to have a fast start so when people at the time of craig berube were like oh it's the coach they he's too hard nosed and he hasn't adapted to this style no it's it's the same message every single game it's we need to fast start or start fast but you're not getting that fast start. And I, I it, it, to me, like when you go back to those successful teams that were doing it, like you mentioned in that Stanley Cup run where you knew what it was going to be, those were all players that had been in the league for eight, nine, ten years with the exception of, of Robert Thomas. And so they, they dropped the puck and it was like, this is how we are winning hockey games. Right. And even Darren Pang had said like that bad start that they had, it had nothing to do with the talent and had everything to do with a team that needed to keep their egos outside of the rink. And when they would start doing that, they started to play. And I have to imagine some of that's in this situation as well. And Donnie, Alex and I were talking the other night in the press box. That's why they beat Edmonton because the game started at eight o'clock. That's when the second period usually starts. It's true. And look at that so first period. It's like there wasn't a first period. Yeah, I, I, And that's why those afternoon games, Donnie, are never good. Because by that time, by the end of it, you're talking, that's the third period. This, this is just nonsense. <laughs> like, like I, I just, I, it's very hard for me to try to, to determine whether or not I want Drew Bannister to come back and be the head coach. Part of me in, in my head says, I know that this is the players and the makeup of the players. It, 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 I mean, it, that's it. It's it. It, it is not on this man, but at the same time, I don't know that we have seen all that much of a dis- – see, I guess if we haven't seen that much of a discernible difference between Bannister and between Baruby, then that just proves that it's the players and that Bannister should probably deserve another chance to stay. Well, and that's why – I don't know. I don't know with the Bannister thing. I, I'll say this with Bannister. If he's not here, he will be brought into another NHL team. He will not be back in the American Hockey League. I mean, there's just no chance. If you're Bannister and you took a team that Baruby got fired from and you make a playoff push, an NHL team will say, hey, this guy will be an, this guy could be an assistant coach for us. I don't know if he gets a head coaching job, but this guy can be an assistant coach. So take that for what it is. But, I, I mean, like, I, I just believe that that's why Doug Armstrong made the decision when he did. Now, sure, the team was scuffling and you had lost to Columbus and Chicago and Detroit, and you were like, we got to make a change. But, but we saw that last year where it was a five, six, seven game losing streak and Armstrong backed Baruby. I think Armstrong probably got to the point where it was like, okay, it's not working with Baruby. He talked about how it was just unknown what this team was going to look like. And he said, if we need to decide if this is a roster issue, we need to have a, a, a good chunk of this season under a different voice to find out if it really is the roster. And again, this is just my mind thinking not anything that I've heard or talked to but that's why I felt like it happened in November because it's like okay it's going to give us five months with Bannister with this team to find out if a different voice can make it better or if it's just a team thing that we have to figure out what to accomplish with in the offseason guys if there is not a and we've talked about this too and I've said it before but like if there is not a seismic seismic trade something in this offseason I would think that that team is going to have trouble selling tickets next year, and this team cannot afford that sort of thing. Am I incorrect in saying that? No, I, I think that it would be an issue. It, you know, let's just say that ninety-eight percent of the roster came back. You know, people are not going to be excited. It's going to be 
a loud crowd in the off season. Well, yeah, you heard how it ended sa- uh, Saturday versus yeah. San Jose. Yeah, and, and and I think eventually, yeah, you might see some empty seats. You know, will it happen next year? I don't know. Sometimes that takes a little bit because what happens is, you know, and I wish we had maybe you know a ticket person to yeah. show sure. this to us. But um, what I think happens is when the team is good people who own the tickets whether it be businesses or season ticket mm-hmm. holders use them whenever it goes to other people whenever they don't want to go to the game because the team's not good or whatever yeah. hey i got blues tickets and then everybody in st louis oh yeah i'll take your tickets you know and, and the building's still full so yeah. you know i would think that we'd have to see some pretty bad hockey for you know a pretty good stretch before we'd start to see some empty seats. well not to like change the the the, the uh the main topic there but I mean, look at the Cardinals, what they've done the last couple of years. Yeah. And like you, I mean, we've heard, we've seen, we've heard vocal fans of, it's like, I don't want to buy tickets right now. I, I'm not saying that's going to happen with the Blues. I mean, the Blues have a very passionate fan base that, I mean, even in bad games, they show up and you see sold out crowds at Enterprise Center. Plus in the wintertime, you know, that's, that's kind of the thing to do. Sure. But yeah, if you return the same roster and don't make significant changes, I mean, just look at what the Cardinals have had to go through these last couple of years to where it was like, I mean, we've all seen like the extra pro promos of like, hey, $5 tickets to get to a Cardinals game. It's right. like, what's going on here? So, I mean, it, their frustration sets in and it builds up more and more the more you get into this. But that's the tough task of Doug Armstrong to where it's like you didn't have a lot of wiggle room. Now at least you have a little bit more wiggle room to work with with that cap going up. Yeah, and I did a mailbag the other day, and one of the questions from one of the readers was, uh, what do the season ticket renewals look like? And so I reached out to somebody with the Blues, and they said, you know, nothing off what we'd you know think that it might right. be. So it could be down a little bit, but nothing drastically sure. off. And I think the one thing that we have to keep in mind is, yeah, you could give up your season tickets and then buy them the next year, but when you got it, the Dvorsky and the Snuggerud and all those guys coming, you're probably going to keep them because you want to be part of what's happening right. here in the next year. Or two. And I don't even want to say that I am rooting for this or that I hope it happens. I'm just saying that as a Blues fan, if you are going to bring back this same package to me just wrapped in new wrapping paper and tell me that it's going to be different, I'm going to be real doubtful of that. Yep. I mean, and if I, I mean, and I understand. I don't know. It it, it 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 it's it's the difference here um again with the retool rebuild, you know, cuz you're not terrible and awful every night, but you're certainly not where you need to be and it's just this frustrating sort of middle yeah. ground and kind of and figuring out how in the hell that Armstrong is going to pull the the knobs to make this whole well, thing work. I, I didn't think last offseason he was going to be able to accomplish it. No, I mean, he had a deal in place. It was just the no trade clause that kicked in, which, of course, that's his biggest hurdle to figure out this offseason if you are moving on from one of those players. But, I, I mean, just one move, let's just go down the hypothetical path, go back in your time machine. Let's say Tory Krug accepted that trade and Philadelphia made the move, and you're talking about a Sanheim and then whomever it was Kevin Hayes that was a part of it. I mean, one move, I think, would have got people excited. So now go to this offseason and look at it and say, okay, does one move make that much of a difference for you? I I really feel like if you do come back with that same roster, there will be frustrated fans. But I felt like there were frustrated fans last year, and then once the season started, it felt like, oh, okay, maybe we see some some positives here, and then it kind of all hit a dud once you hit November. Yeah, who knows what's going to happen because you have to have another team willing to, to make the move with you. Right. But I just, I mean, I would almost bet my house, whatever possession you want to talk about. Well, that's about. good because you got a place to live, McDonald's. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 you I broke got, him. I got a spit take from Jim. I love it. Let's it. go. You got to edit out that spit. No, that, that no, 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 no. That's staying in. And and also, so people know, pretty soon we're going to be doing this video style. Oh, so you're going to be oh, able yeah. to see that happen. Jared, you need to take a drink next time you do that. I do. That was rough. Well, let's spit the other way. The, uh, I just think that if, if I know anything about Doug Armstrong following his team for the past 12 years, is there's just not a chance he's going to watch this product again. Yeah. Like, he is not going to sit up in that management booth <laughs> in 2024, 25, and watch 98% of that team come back next season. Just it's, because you're answering the same questions all over, and it's like, I, I think he recognizes that there's an issue. It was like, okay, last year was. And he even said it to us at the draft in Nashville. Like, we we hope that last year was just a, a one-off for the defense and the team overall so that we could go back next year. And if it's not, then changes will be made. And 
I, I think it, now, granted, it's not as bad as what last year was. I mean, last year we were talking about seven game losing streaks, and that defense was bad last yeah. year. But now. I think he saw it, and then you fire a coach, and you look at it, and you say, okay, well, those changes haven't really been made. We're only talking about the power play and the goaltending being significantly different from when Craig Berube was here to when he's not here. So, yeah, I, I Doug Armstrong just doesn't seem like the type of guy that's going to be like, well, one more year, we'll run it back and see what happens. He'll find wiggle room, he'll find loopholes, and he'll make moves, just like he did with Yuri Laterra. Am, uh, am I incorrect in saying that the Winnipeg Jets have now lost seven in a row, or did they win one? They beat sense. L.A. Okay, so they yeah. got to win. But yeah. they have been stumbling oh, a bunch. Yeah. And boy, doesn't it seem like the time of the year for the Jets to start to stumble. Do you guys think that this is, you know, how, how do you see this shaking down? And how do you see, you know, I haven't asked you in a couple of weeks, how do you see the West as we get closer to the playoffs, Colorado <laughs> Avalanche? As we talked about earlier in our podcast, where Jay and I don't even remember what's freaking going on the last <laughs> sorry, game. Sorry, we boys. Both pull up, no, we both pull up our phone and we're like, wait, where are the standings at right now? I, I don't think Winnipeg gets out of the first round. And I might be crazy with this one. I Because it's going to be the Kings or the Knights, right? No, Winnipeg's going to be Colorado unless it's either going to be Colorado or Dallas unless Nashville catches them. Then you're talking about them being a wild card. They're in third place right now. Nashville's six points behind them with 75 games to go. So, like, they could catch Winnipeg, and that would put Winnipeg into a you're taking on Dallas or Vancouver, whoever's the first place team. But. I, I just don't see Winnipeg. I thought Winnipeg was one of the best teams there around January, February. When they traded for Toffoli, I was thinking, oh, wow, that's going to be a tough team. I think they are dealing with injuries still. I think Toffoli's been in and out. Velarde's been in and out. Their goaltending is what I don't believe in, which is odd to say because they have the best goaltender in yeah. Connor Hellebuck, but I know how Connor Hellebuck operates, and it, it, once you get to the postseason, man, they stumble. Defensively, I don't think they're a very good team. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think they get out of the first round. Frankly, right now... I think that the, the scariest team is Dallas. I, Colorado doesn't scare me because of Georgiev. Vancouver has also been stumbling. The only reason Vancouver oh, yeah. clinched a playoff spot was because the Blues lost to San Jose. Yeah. Otherwise, they they might lose the first place spot to Edmonton. You just saw what the Edmonton looks like against the Blues. Vegas is still injured. Nashville's a little scary, but do you really think they go anywhere? So I, I think Dallas is the scariest team right now in the West. And yeah. they, they, I mean, they're the, the most seemingly solid team but of even everybody. They have goaltending questions because Ottinger hasn't been great this season. And, and I think uh, if you look at the two teams in the wild card race that occupy those two spots right now, Nashville and LA Kings, uh, bo- I believe they've both lost three in a row, mm-hmm. like uh, three game. Yeah, Nashville lost last night. For both Nashville lost again last night. So this Blues situation, you know, it's it's you just can't count them out completely yeah. yet but as Alex has touched on I mean you got to go 6 and 1 7 and 0 oh, down the stretch because LA then could go like 4 and 4 yeah. and 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 still get in but you know it's going to be a big game uh, Nashville having what did it get up to 18 straight games with a point yeah 18 before straight they games lost these uh, last 3 in a row and, and I think these last 3 so they were shut out by the Bruins I think these last 3 they've given up God, it was it was eight against Arizona. It was six. So I think they've given up seventeen goals in their last three games. Wow! And the yeah. Blues' schedule, um, you know, it isn't as light and soft as the Kings' schedule down the stretch, uh, because they do have Nashville Thursday, and they do have Carolina, and they do have Dallas. But I'll tell you what that that Dallas game is the last game of the regular season. Right. If, if the and, Stars have the President's Trophy, and they're sitting guys. But remember, L.A. Because, I'm going to say L.A. because I don't think you're chasing Vegas after Vegas' win last night. I think you're chasing L.A., although right. we've seen that flip quick. Both L.A. and Vegas play the night after you. Oh, okay. So the way I've looked at this is you've got seven games. Seven and up would put you at 14 points, and they're saying 98 points is what it takes to get into the playoffs. 98 points is where you're at. L.A. would need to get 12 points out of their final 16 available points to them to completely eliminate you. But if L.A. goes, let's say they go 4-4 four and four down the stretch, that gives them 95 points. That still means you need to put together 15, or I'm sorry, 13 out of your final 16 points. So 
you're talking about the point where if you lose another game in regulation and LA wins, now it's it seems like it's about as impossible as impossible could get. This is the weirdest year for me and wanting them to make the playoffs or not wanting them to make the playoffs. I still am just kind of up and down and 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 you know, I don't know. I just don't know exactly what it means, especially after you see them play terrible and then play well. So I'm not sure how this is all going to shake out. For the that's why, we lo- that's why we love this time of the year, right, Donnie? Uh, well, let's get it. Here's here's I'm going to just say my tinfoil thought right now. What's going to happen? The Blues are going to go 6 0 and 1, 7 and 1, some, or 7 and 0, something like that to the point where they do everything to where Blues fans are like, they're getting in. And then LA plays that last game of the season, much like that, that year that they missed the playoffs prior to the Stanley Cup year, and they missed it by one point. And that one point, you're going to go back and you're going to sit for the first two weeks of the season going, well, if you didn't lose to the Sharks yep. or the Blue Jackets. The one that Grant brought up was, remember the Boston Bruins loss here in St. Louis, the tripping oh, call that yeah. took place yeah. in overtime that would that cost them the game? Oh, yeah. yeah. Grant brought that up to me, and he said, if you miss by one point, how much is that game going to piss you off? And I said, well, because there have been so many of them that were frustrating, I don't know if you'd live on that. But it's like now that you said that, yeah, you're going to think back to that and be like, oh, awesome, way to go. Well, there's so many of those. That's, though, that's too. the thing. And I told him it's like it doesn't really matter because so many have burned you this year. Well, you know, I, I don't even it, – it, It's it, to me, it's just been entertaining to be like, all right, turn on the TV. <laughs> yeah. Which team am I going to get tonight? It's like which, roulette. Which, which roll of the dice is this going to be, man? Donnie, Always. I'm trying to decide whether to get in the car tomorrow and go to Nashville because uh, we were definitely going to go down there for Snuggeroon. For Snuggeroon? Debut, and uh, now that that's not the case, you know, you still got to keep an eye on this team. Right. So I, I, Look, you beat Nashville. I think there are going to be a lot of people that doubt this team that are going to buy in. But then you play back-to-back games against San Jose and Anaheim. So, like, you can't go beat Edmonton and Nashville and then lose a game to, to San Jose or Anaheim. And when I, you say buy-in, you mean watch another game. Yeah, buy-in meaning buy in. Don't, don't yell from the rooftops that this team is going to miss the playoff. You do want to go to that game tomorrow night, though, because I believe Nashville's hanging a banner for that winning streak. Oh, Are they? An 18-game an 18, uh, point I, I'm streak. I'm pretty sure wow. that they're that they're stitching that thing up right yeah, now. That There's sounds a about few right. bars on the Broadway that the reason I'm going Yeah, I was going to say, Jared's not going for the game. Jared will be like, I'll, I'll watch the game. It is not nice of Jesus to put Ryan O'Reilly on that team. (laughs) He did that to me. (laughs) I hate that team so he was gonna say freaking Jesus. much. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Jesus seems like a nice guy and a hell of a hockey player turf. from what he I understand. seems like a nice guy. <laughs> he seems like a good dude. I mean, you know, man. I mean, all things considered. Hey, uh, feeding poor, you know what I mean? Uh, like, I know good person. I know we're about to wrap this up. Um, you know how we always like to end this on, on a note where Donnie seems to be really upset? Yeah, let's oh, do it. Can I give you some, some big news for Donnie to see his reaction? Yeah, let's see it. He's wearing his Buffalo Bill oh, shirt wait, today. Oh, I know what's coming. I saw it. I saw it. Wait, wait, wait. So this is live? Well, this not is live, This is live. You have not seen this news Are you yet. Guys, for a fact that Donnie has not seen this Did Stefan news? Diggs ask for a trade? Uh, he didn't just ask for a trade, big boy. He was traded. What? To the Houston Texans. Shut up! For a second round. I saw that pop up a, a couple sixth minutes round ago. and a fifth round pick. <laughs> what? So make sure you get some good guys with those picks. Yeah. Donnie. Make sure you draft a good wide receiver in second round. Boy, you did it. I shouldn't have done it. That was really mean of me, Donnie. No, it's not mean of you to do. <laughs> who, who in the hell is Josh Allen going to throw the goddamn ball to now? Uh, Shakir. <laughs> hey, you want to know something funny? Uh-oh. Look on the back of my Uh-oh. Oh, my gosh. He's, He's wearing, wearing a, a Diggs, <laughs> Diggs jersey. <laughs> this, this totally should have been the that one we had so on YouTube. Outdated. Donnie, I, I looked at that and I said, oh, my God. You should get draft pick on the back. Dudes. <laughs> you should get second round pick. Dudes. Uh, that's that's rough. D- <laughs> so, wait. I'm sorry. We're going to end this. But. W- w- I- those, draft Sen- pick, those draft picks, man. I at least thought you were going to get a wide receiver from Houston back, but nope. We okay, need, guys. We, we got to get this thing on I, YouTube. I, yeah. I, oh, yeah. This has to be on YouTube after this one. I, I don't. I, I'm unless he asked and wanted to be out, which I which I think could be a possibility. If he 
because it was obvious at times that he was not super happy. But he's going to be going to a Houston team where he is not going to be the primary number one receiver. <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> We've had two spit takes, Donnie. Two of them to today. You're going to have to finish the show. <laughs> but here's the Dude, part that I don't understand. You traded him to another AFC team. Uh, an AFC team that is already <laughs> loaded on Please? offense, Alex. Man, that's not a good move by your uh, general manager. Brandon Bean, what are you doing? Yeah. Guys, I'm so sorry. I did not mean to throw this and make this as long well, as it was. Technically, but... I threw this one in there, but I, I think we got gold out of it. I want to go home. <laughs> like, I, I I need a minute to collect my thoughts. It's about as perfect as you can ask that Guys, he's wearing the jersey, too. L- let, let, me, let me just tell you something right now. Let me just tell you something right now. <laughs> I take this way too seriously. And I have to go and get my thoughts together. Understandable. I, this is un. Yeah. What are we doing? What are we doing? Who is Josh <laughs> Allen going to throw the friggin' ball to? Who? 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 I guess it's Dawson Knox and Dalton Kincaid, and I guess we're going to expect James Cook to not drop at least one ball a game. What are we Daddy, doing? I, I got your answer. I got your answer. Second round pick. I got your answer. Read the Athletic. It'll be in there in a few hours. Booyah! Who they're going to throw the ball to. But and JR's not going to write it, though. No, my dude Joe Biscaglia will. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Last Minute Blues podcast for uh, for, uh, <laughs> for the 12 other people that aren't in the room. Uh, uh, Jamie Rivers, our homeboy Jeff Burton, we miss you so much, brother. For Alex Ferrario, Jeremy Rutherford, I'm Donnie Fandango. Uh, as always, thanks for listening, and let's go Blues. The Last Minute Blues Podcast. Hear more at 1057thepoint.com.